Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our Colonies During the English Commonwealth Series. Today's episode takes us to Massachusetts Bay, where the year 1649 was rather uneventful. After the passing of former governor John Winthrop, who also was someone whose writings we've relied on heavily in this podcast, a familiar face assumes the role as the colony's governor, and that is John Endicott. Endicott had previously served as the first and tenth governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now with the passing of John Winthrop, he would become the 13th governor of the colony. One event of interest is in the general court records of May 1649. The colony was experiencing a dispute with newly annexed Springfield, a village that today is in the very southern part of Massachusetts, north of the Connecticut border. Springfield, when it was originally founded, was part of the Connecticut colony. Springfield believed that they did not have to pay towards the construction of a fort, and so a dispute broke out. The United Colonies commissioners would get involved, and they would determine that the town had to pay towards the fort. An odd thing occurs after that, and that is that the Massachusetts Bay Colony passes a series of duties or tariffs, if you would, against the export of furs and skins from the colony to other members of the United Colonies. An import duty was also imposed. Now, trade economics 350 years ago are much different than they are today, but it's just kind of an odd thing that uh, they would make trade more prohibitive with their allies. Also in those May 1649 records, the colony used one barrel of gunpowder for the funeral of John Winthrop. On May 12, 1649, there were a number of ships in Boston Harbor with what the colony called diverse strangers, and it actually scared colonial leadership to the point where they had military come in, or militia, and monitor the harbor. At the same time, the boundary dispute is unfolding between Massachusetts Bay and Connecticut. And the Massachusetts Bay Colony admits in their records that they don't know where the southern boundary is. So the colony became very interested in working with Connecticut to solve this dispute. And part of that has to do with Springfield flip-flopping in and out. So, uh, but Massachusetts Bay admits they don't know where the border is, and they want to work with Connecticut to solve that. Hopefully that works uh, well for everybody. We'll find out later. The colony placed a heavy fine on the export of horses and mares and a fine of 12 pence for public drunkenness. In October, a new presence is detected in New England as indicated in a letter from Massachusetts Bay to the Plymouth Colony. Let's have a look. We have heard heretofore of diverse Anabaptists arisen up in your jurisdiction and connived at but being but few, we well hope that it might have pleased God by the endeavors of yourselves and the faithful elders with you to have reduced such erring men again into the right way. The letter goes on. But now to our great grief, we are credibly informed that your patient bearing with such men hath produced another effect, namely the multiplying and increasing of the same errors, and we fear maybe of other errors also, if timely care not be taken to suppress the same. The Anabaptists, this is the first time I've seen them mentioned, and they may have been new to New England, but their origins actually date back to 1527. They originated in an area of the world that is today 
the border of Germany and Switzerland. While their belief system differs from the religions of the day in many respects, their fundamental difference is that they believed baptism should not occur until an individual is able to understand and consent to it. Up to this point, infant baptism was a common belief among all the religious sects in England, the English colonies, and for the most part, Europe. As a result of their beliefs, Anabaptists were persecuted throughout Europe and throughout England. While persecution is the likely cause for the Anabaptists coming to America, why are we just now seeing them in 1649? Well, that's because of a major world event in Europe. It's likely that the Peace of Westphalia, which occurred in 1648, is likely responsible for Anabaptists fleeing Europe for America. The treaty ended both the Thirty Years and the Eighty Years War, which was mainly fought between Catholic and Protestant nations. With the Anabaptists being enemies of both religions, a peace between Catholics and Protestants made it likely that persecution among the Anabaptists would increase. It makes sense. If they're not fighting each other, they can focus more of their attention on the Anabaptists. Back to the letter of concern that I just quoted from. The letter goes on to say that in the past few weeks, 13 or 14 persons have been rebaptized, And the letter goes on to call for the suppression of those errors. A direct quote that may shine some light onto the exact sentiment of the uh, Puritans towards the Anabaptists, they used the following language, and I quote, the infection of such diseases being near us are likely to spread into our jurisdiction. So they saw Anabaptist beliefs as an infection or an infectious disease that was spreading amongst the people uh, in Plymouth and later Massachusetts Bay. At the same court that we're talking about here, in May 1650, Thomas Dudley would be elected as governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And this would be his third stint. Remember, he was a rival of John Winthrop. And the general court there in May 1650 took up several issues. One was whether the town of Exeter, located in modern-day New Hampshire and founded by a colony defector, uh, remember Reverend Wheelwright, could freely choose its own constable. The town was granted permission as long as the court approved their pick. It is likely at this point that Massachusetts Bay had extended its influence into all of the existing New Hampshire colony. So they're really pushing things to the north. And frankly, as we've seen in other episodes, especially in Rhode Island, they're getting people south of them nervous as well. The general court also named the first president and board members of the young Harvard College. Henry Dunster was named president and the first board of trustees were selected. The assembly also accepted the resignation of the Plymouth Colony in regards to a disputed territory. And by this time, the Plymouth Colony, again, it hadn't really grown much from when it was first founded 30 years prior. So they are becoming more and more shut off from the rest of New England, and as a result, they're becoming less and less relevant. The assembly also banned bowling, forbid Dutch and French trading with natives. That's interesting. Uh, so apparently if you're Dutch and French in the region, you cannot trade with natives. I'd be interested to see how that was enforced. And that was it for the May general court. In October, they met again and they passed a law forbidding husbands from striking their wives. So essentially a domestic violence law there in October of 1650. 
The next matter they took up was a book written by William Pynchon. Pynchon was no stranger to New England. He founded Roxbury and Springfield. He had been a resident of the colonies for approximately 20 years. But in 1649, Pynchon wrote a book entitled The Meritus Price of Our Redemption, and it was published in London in 1650. The book argued that obedience, rather than the Puritan ideology of punishment and suffering, was the price of atonement. The general court considered the book to be erroneous and blasphemous, and ordered an investigation. They also called Pynchon to testify before the court and questioned whether or not he would even own up to being the book's author. William Pynchon was no uh, slouch in terms of his role in New England society. Remember, he founded two towns and was actually considered amongst the, the elite in the colony. But Again, his book stepped on the toes of the Puritans, so we'll have to see if any additional punishment comes out of that. The court also approved a payment of £100 to Harvard College, and this was per the request of President Henry Dunster. And the court also authorized pay to its soldiers of two shillings per day. Moving forward to May of 1651, the general court elected again John Endicott to serve as governor. The court saw the need to increase taxes due to the growing amount of debt the colony had incurred. The court also looked to address a serious problem. Let's have a look at the writing. That henceforward thou shall be no dancing upon such occasion or at other times upon the pain or penalty of five shillings for every person that shall dance. Dancing is now illegal in Massachusetts Bay. And put that alongside of bowling. So early 1650s Massachusetts Bay, no bowling, no dancing. The court also affirmed Parliament's law of October 1650 which was to refuse trade with Barbados, Bermuda, Antigua, and Virginia. These were English colonies still loyal to the Royalists or the Crown. The court also sent a letter of warning to Roger Williams in Providence as some colonists protested the threat of injury by the colony. So something was going on there that made Massachusetts Bay feel threatened by Rhode Island. Now, Roger Williams has historically here played the in-between. We saw that in the Pequot War. And so hopefully these letters to him will help calm things down because if you'll recall from our Rhode Island episode, they're a little animated too by the happenings in Massachusetts Bay. The court also heard about charges against Mary Parsons from Springfield. Let's have a look at the writing. Mary Parsons of Springfield, being committed to prison for suspicion of witchcraft, as also for murdering one of her child, was this day called forth and indicted for witchcraft. By the name of Mary Rogers, you are here before the general court, charged that not having the fear of God before your eyes, nor in your heart, being seduced by the devil and yielding to his malicious motion, consulted with a familiar spirit, making a covenant with him, and have used diverse devilish practices by witchcraft. The court found the evidences were not sufficient to prove her a witch, and therefore she was cleared in that respect. So we have a witchcraft hearing of Mary Parsons, and she is found at that time to be innocent. But then, renewed charges come up related to Mary Parsons' behavior while in prison, and a new hearing is set. She's accused again of murdering her child in addition to witchcraft, 
and in court confesses to the murder. Mary Parsons is convicted and hanged a few days later by the people of Springfield for witchcraft and for murder. The letter to the general court reporting these events was written by William Pynchon, the man accused of blasphemy. Now what is important here is that Mary Parsons was acquitted and then convicted later for the same crime. Obviously in American history that is going to become a big topic further down the line. The court also ordered the payment of seven pounds sixteen shillings to the inhabitants of Charlestown who suffered the loss of their homes in a recent fire. This is the first time I've seen any form of aid by a, a governing body for loss of property due to a natural disaster. And again, I might be wrong by this, but I'm you know prepared in future conversations to say that the 1651 payments to Charlestown are probably the first uh, government aid program designed to help people fighting uh, the damage of a natural disaster. In October 1651, the court restored limited trading authority to Virginia, asking merchants to take sufficient caution. But the court would find a new problem that it would spend a significant amount of time on. Let's have a look at the writing. To declare our utter detestation and dislike that men or women of mean condition should take upon them the garb of gentlemen by wearing gold or silver lace or buttons or points at their knees or to walk in great boots or women of the same rank to wear silk or tiffany hoods or scarfs which though allowable to persons of greater estates we cannot but judge it intolerable in persons of such like condition so those of estates worth less than 200 pounds were forbidden from wearing visible gold and silver. This became known as a dress code for the poor. The records go on to show a special court was to be formed in a few months. This court of assistance would be responsible for leading trials against those in Boston jailed for suspected witchcraft. A few weeks ago, we talked about the Connecticut witch trials, and those started in the late 1630s, early 1640s, and lasted for a long period of time. They are still going on now, and it's becoming evident that that is spreading into Massachusetts Bay since they're forming a separate trial. John Endicott was re-elected governor in May of 1652 and at this general court a law was passed making the denial of any book of the Bible a crime. The fine would be 10 pounds and the person would be whipped if they did not have the money. The court also created laws against deception by bakers, the defacing of public records, against poor fish in the markets, the removal of juries in civil litigation unless they are requested by plaintiff or defendant, and all defendants must be charged with their crime within a year of offense, essentially a statute of limitations. The colony was dealing with a growing theft problem in 1652, and the court added whipping as a penalty to thefts greater than 10 pounds. Previously, the punishment was simply a reimbursement of loss. Arson was becoming a problem too. The court charged that anyone caught setting a fire to anything could be whipped and depending on the severity of their crimes, they could be put to death. And that kind of makes sense with the society at the time because arsons in, in that type of environment were very dangerous. Now, with that being said, I rewind my mind back to Charlestown. I don't think that was an arson that caused that issue, but I don't know for sure. The documents did not mention a cause. The court also decided to create regulations around the colony's militia. Let's have a look at the writing. 
And it is further ordered by this court and the authority thereof that all Scotchmen, Negroes, and Indians inhabiting with our service to the English from the age of 16 to 60 years shall be listed and are hereby enjoined to attend trainings as well as the English, and that every company shall have two drummers. So that is a rather inclusive policy for the colony's militia. They really don't care where you come from. If you're between the age of 16 and 60, we'll train you to defend the colony. If you'll recall in the pre-Civil War era or in the time leading right up to the Civil War, there was this great fear of slave ins insurrection. And so slaves were kept very much in the dark about just about anything, but of course, access to weapons. Well, here in Massachusetts Bay in 1652, they're training Africans who come over. They're training Scotchmen, immigrants, natives. And this is to defend the colony against an external threat, such as the Dutch or the French or another hostile native tribe. The colony also covered the cost of having farmers who lived outside of the towns trained. So they've got rural farmers out there very, very vulnerable to attack. So they stepped in and helped train them too. The colony also allowed a group of men living on Conduit Street in Boston to form the first corporation designated to provide water to the town on Conduit Street. It is considered the first public water company in the New World. The court then decided, this is interesting, to mint its own currency. According to the court records, this was done to avoid the abuse of the current monies in circulation. A man by the name of John Hull was designated the master of the mint to produce the new coin, and it was going to be created by melting down other currencies. I'm wondering what the English are going to think of that, and we know it's going to get back to them. The name of the currency was the pine tree shilling. The initial conversion rate was nine pence per pine tree shilling, but just like a foreign exchange market, that did move around and it swung around quite a bit. The act of minting their own currency was done without the English government's authority or approval. I just got this feeling that minting your own currency without letting the motherland know, but using their currency, melting it down to create your own, probably isn't going to go over well. But we're not going to come back to Massachusetts Bay for a few weeks. So we'll find out when we get back to Massachusetts Bay. But next week, we're going to travel to a new part of the New World. And uh, it's another matter that occurred at this time that did involve Massachusetts Bay. It focuses on the founding of the Maine colony. And we'll talk about that next time on Historical Context.